Hi, welcome to the Picture This podcast. Today we're covering the story behind the photo. We're going deep into four really famous photos that you will definitely recognize and looking into the stories behind them. You can watch this on YouTube or you can check out our podcast at scp.io slash podcast. It's on all the all your favorite podcasting apps. Tony, do you know what? What? This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is a beautiful place to create a blog, online store, or website. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. So you can try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony and use the coupon code portfolio for 10% off. Squarespace, build it beautiful. Thanks for sponsoring this, Squarespace. Chelsea, I'm mostly going to be a sidekick, so why don't you lead us through the oh, four pictures? Oh, you're my pictures. sidekick. That's right. Um, well, the first picture, I know some of you are just listening to the audio, but even a description of these pictures will make them recognizable. Yeah, it's, this is Einstein sticking his tongue out. Yeah, Einstein Everybody sticking knows his this. tongue out. It's iconic. The photographer is author Sassy, and the picture was taken in 1951. You know it. He's sticking out his tongue. His eyebrows are up. It's used everywhere. It's on mugs. It's on everything. So the story goes, you've seen this picture everywhere, but the story behind it is that Einstein is celebrating his birthday at the Princeton Club, and he's surrounded by colleagues and friends, but there were also a lot of photographers attending the event. And Einstein wasn't really into this. He was kind of a private and shy guy. He didn't really want a ton of press, but you know, he was super famous. People were taking pictures of him. But we could provide a little context. It's 1951. Yeah. So World War II has ended with a massive atomic explosion. And Einstein is largely to credit for this. Certainly a lot of people are giving him credit for this. He's done a lot of work on this. He's certainly at the time of the world's most famous scientist. Yeah. He's so he's one of the most famous people on the planet. And certainly everybody in America is giving him some amount of credit for ending the war. Yes. He's, he's a, a big, he's big deal. He's a rock deal. star. Yeah. A science rock star. Like Stephen Hawking's a big deal now. Mm -hmm. But Stephen Hawking didn't end any wars with his science. He's just a good scientist. Einstein's a rock star. <laughs> the rock star is a rock star is better than a scientist. But <laughs> so it's the end of the night. He's ready to go home. His friend, Dr. Frank Idolot, offered him a ride home. And the photographers rush at the car. And this is when Arthur Sassy, the photographer, gets kind of in the way, gets right in front of the car with the door open and asks Einstein for one last picture, one last smile. And instead of smiling, Einstein sticks out his tongue. And that's how you get this famous picture. No other photographer there got it. He was the one that got the shot. And the editors... Sat it wasn't something Einstein did on a regular basis. It wasn't something planned or posed. The photographer didn't do anything. It was a right time, right place thing, it sounds like. Yeah, also did Einstein drink? Just a good question now. <laughs> but anyway, so the photographer's editors debated whether or not the photo was even appropriate, but it went to print. It was a huge hit. Even Einstein loved it, and he requested nine copies of the print and then sent them to his friends and family as greeting cards. Yeah, and he used it on his uh, Facebook as his Facebook profile picture for weeks. So here's the uncropped version. For those of you not viewing this podcast, you can see he's with his two friends in the back. And he's sticking out his tongue in the back of a car. They both seem to be having a good time. And then in this picture, you can see that he just wasn't making any face at all. He was looking down. So even if he hadn't taken a few more shots, he might not have gotten that important moment. Yeah, it was a split second. It wasn't like he was just walking around sticking his tongue out or just generally being goofy. He was just hanging with his friends. Had a spontaneous moment. Okay. So I want to go back here because I talked about Dr. Frank Idolot. I believe that's how you say his name. This guy here, Tony, I was, re I was researching this picture and that name sounded really familiar. And do you know why? I don't know why. <laughs> because his house is four houses down from us. <laughs> uh, Does he still live there? No, I he guess doesn't he's still probably live really there. Dead. He passed away a long time ago. Um, but one of his family members lives there. Oh, that's and funny. And we had a town meeting not too long ago when people were talking about how this is a historic district and how Einstein had spent time at our beach and in our neighborhood. And so I just thought it was funny that here's a picture, one of the most famous pictures of Einstein and a guy that lived down the street from us is in it. Small world. Small world. This picture, people definitely know this picture. This is a more upsetting picture by photographer Kevin Carter, and it's called The Vulture and the Little Girl. It was taken in 1993. You probably recognize it. It's a starving child in Sudan, and there's a vulture. She, she's crouched on the ground, sort of folded mm -hmm. forward, almost like 
when you see the picture, you, you the story it tells is a girl who can't support her own weight. Her yeah. ribs are poking through. She has some sort of necklace, but her she's folded forward with her forehead almost against the sort of barren ground with just little patches of grass. And yeah, just just out of focus in the background is a large vulture. Yeah, it's a really upsetting photo. And, and there's nothing else in the frame, basically. No. Just sort of barren, barren ground. So this photographer, Carter, he took a trip to Sudan with the United Nations as a part of something called Operation Lifeline, and he was a photojournalist that was invited. Um, and as they were flying, they stopped at a feeding center, a distribution center, to drop off food. And the photojournalists were told, you have like a half hour, we're going to land, we're going to get this food to the feeding center, you can take your pictures, and then come right back, we have to take off again. So is his job there to sort of document the efforts that are going yes, on, maybe people for know, their own promotional materials? Yeah, people know that there are people in need and people are starving, and so he's there to document it, and these UN workers are there to help bring food and some relief to the people. So his goal is probably to capture a picture that would motivate people to donate money. Exactly, To help exactly. his cause. He's trying to do a good thing. So he got off the plane, and women from the community were helping get food off the plane and bring it back to, to the feeding center and while they were lifting the food they were letting their children just kind of you know come out and lay around and carter was taking pictures of all of the kids and he happened to see the scene where the little girl is laying there and there's a vulture and the story goes that he kind of quietly snuck up hung around took a few pictures and then shooed the vulture off the photo was published in the new york times march 26 1993 and people went crazy everybody wanted to know how the girl was doing people were disturbed by the picture people were motivated to help uh solve hunger people were really upset and it brought this issue home but carter also came under fire by a lot of people because they wanted to know like what happened to the girl did you fight off the vulture why didn't you pick the girl up and feed her why didn't you save her so he was held responsible in a way um, and it was partially because people didn't know the whole story Part of that story was that the people at the UN, the people with Operation Lifeline, told the photojournalists not to touch people because there were diseases, communicable diseases going around, and they, they didn't want them to be spread. Yeah, if he had, he might have been quarantined. He might have passed the disease on to the other relief workers there. He yeah. actually could have made the situation much worse. Also, but also, it doesn't sound like she directly needed help. She was in the process of receiving aid. She had parents there. I guess what I'm saying is the the real story is not the story that you you read from the picture. When you look at the picture, you see a starving child alone yeah. and a vulture waiting to devour that child's body upon its death. Ooh. That yeah. that is how the picture reads to me. But yeah. that's not the situation. The situation is there was an aid station where people were actively receiving food. There was a, a number of parents and children there, parents caring and watching over the children, just out of the frame probably. And so a, a lot of the story is told by the, the photographer's composition. And as photographers, this is always the case. We, where there's always so much going on just outside the edges of the frame right. that can tell a key part of the story and, and more of the truth. And there's usually more context to the story. But I think yeah. it's kind of an interesting ethical situation for a photographer because you can be in a position where you can document someone's suffering. And I think that that feels bad. And I think that, that can feel... Uh, what would be the word, like you're benefiting from someone's suffering. Um, but you also have to take into consideration that this girl's story was spread in a way where it made people feel compassion and it made people care about an issue that was so far away from them. So do the means justify the end? Right, right. I, in my opinion, his original picture was untrue. I mean, it's a photo. It was a real moment. But the story it told wasn't the true story. Well, but here's the thing. I, I agree that the picture didn't depict the moment he was in, but the reality is that was one child of thousands and thousands, and not all of the children were benefiting from aid, and I'm sure there wasn't enough aid. So it told a story yeah. bigger than that one girl, but that girl was one of many, and not all of them were at the feeding center. So Yeah, definitely any sort of you know distribution of, of especially items needed for survival to the poor, that's a great cause. And, and I think often we do this sort of selective, uh, it, it's impossible to capture the total amount of suffering that's right. going on. Yeah, it's hard to get that in one picture. Yeah. 
Um, you also mentioned earlier that the it wasn't that the vulture was necessarily waiting for the child to die, which is how the picture reads, but you said there there was some sort of waste facility nearby, well, and so vultures another, were just around. There was another photojournalist there with Carter, and his side of the story was that he went off a little bit further to look for something else to take pictures of, um, and he said that Carter kind of stayed behind near the plane and took pictures of the kids. His The way that he recalled the vulture was that there was some kind of waste nearby that was attracting the vultures. But it does look like the, the vulture is interested in the child. Um, so, but Kevin Carter, he won good a, person, fantastic photographer. Yeah. He, this composition, just amazing in every way. Mm -hmm. Fantastic storytelling. He won a Pulitzer Prize for the picture in 1994. Deservedly. And this sad story gets a little bit sadder. He took his life in 1994 as well. So he won a Pulitzer Prize. He, he took his life and... He was quoted saying, I'm haunted by the vivid memories of killings and corpses and anger and pain of starving or wounded children of trigger happy madmen, often police of killer executioners. And he took his own life. So he, he also complained he didn't have money and that he couldn't pay child support and that he couldn't pay for food and that he was very, very broke. And it sounded like he had depression, but he also seemed to be really haunted by these things that he had to document. So. I'm also sure that it didn't help that he was criticized so widely by the American public and the press. Yeah, I think that's hard. I mean, people question your intentions when you take pictures of certain subject matter. And here's a guy who says he didn't have money and he was suffering from depression himself. And these images haunted him and these experiences haunted him. Uh, he had far more disturbing pictures and experiences. Um, and yeah, it was just it was a heavy burden for him to bear. Moving on a little lighter. Anything would be lighter. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Still you know, important. Lots of important lessons in there. There's a lot of heavy content, but this is what makes a picture powerful. You have to take pictures of something that matters to people. And this is a timeless subject. Um, and it just happened to stay popular and stay relevant and, and really depict a part of humanity that people find moving. And it's something we all, we as photographers always struggle with when we're we're taking pictures, even though the the gravity of it won't be as as serious as that photo. Anytime you take a picture, you're you're cropping something out. Mm -hmm. You're finding the most beautiful scene, in in a potentially ugly situation, or maybe you're finding something ugly and sad in a scene that actually isn't that bad. These are decisions yeah. we make, and how we share them, and the stories that we tell are important. And uh, and it's it's difficult to decide how truthful you want to be versus how creative you want to be. How many of you know the famous Marilyn Monroe picture where there's air coming up and blowing up her skirt and she's pushing it down coyly? Uh, this the answer is everybody. everybody. There's statues made of it. Oh, yeah, there were statues. You see posters. This picture is taken by Sam Shaw and it was taken in 1954. I thought the story was really interesting. I had so much fun researching this podcast, actually, because the stories behind all of these pictures were so rich and surprising to me. First, it's an amazing photo. This is, is Marilyn Monroe in 1954. She's got her kind of short, curly blonde hair. Mm -hmm. She's in this iconic white dress that wraps around the back of her neck. And, and the dress itself is kind of long and flirty. And she's standing on subway grating. And presumably the subway train has gone underneath, pushing air through the grating as it does in New York. And, and this has pushed her skirt up um, in a, a small amount of fake modesty. She's yeah. reached down with her right hand to hold her skirt down and sort of cover up as much of her legs as possible. But it's still, it's a sexy picture because it's exposing sort of the, the shape of her legs. Yeah. It's, it's still a modest picture. There's no nudity or implied nudity or anything. She's got like bloomers on or something. Um, but at the same time, it, it's, it just has this gorgeous composition and exposure and the, the skirt is kind of flying up. It's an amazing picture and she as a model has the kind of perfect kind of surprised expression to go along with it. Fantastic picture. Did you know that the photographer behind this picture was actually famous before Marilyn Monroe? I did not know that. Sam Shaw? His name's Sam Shaw, and he met her on the set of Viva Zapata. It was a Marlon Brando movie uh, from 1952. Does and, that mean live shoe? <laughs> um, it, I need to practice yeah, my Spanish some more. It's actually, it's like a, a true story. You should look into it. I don't remember everything offhand now, but it's supposed to be a great movie. She was his driver. OK, she wanted a role in this movie, Viva Zapata, but she was inexperienced and the producers didn't think that she had the draw in the box office. 
And so she ended up being a driver and she drove Sam to the set every day. He was the set photographer and they became very good friends, lifelong friends, in fact. So a few years later, when she was well known and famous and was on the set of The Seven Year Itch, Shaw was the photographer and he was asked to take pictures to promote the movie to get, you know, people in, get those box office numbers up. At the time, he had already done a shoot where he was taking a a magazine cover shoot and he was taking pictures of sailors and it happened to be a windy day. The sailors were with women and their skirts were blowing up and it ended up being a really popular cover and it ended up being a popular picture for him because of the skirts. So using that success of these windy skirts, he had an idea. What he was going to do is plan a publicity stunt with Marilyn Monroe. So what they did is they pretended to film part of the movie with access to the public. So like 15,000 fans showed up, thousands of fans showed up to watch Marilyn Monroe shoot a scene from the seven year itch. None of the footage actually got used. But what Sam Shaw did was he posed her over the gray on Lexington Avenue in New York City, knowing a train would go by, knowing that the wind would come up and got ready for a picture. And when it happened, They all pretended it was a surprise. She pushed pushed down her her skirt and acted coy. And she yelled out to her friend, hi, Sam Spade, which was her nickname for him. Of course, it blew up. People love the picture. It's still famous to this day. But Sam Shaw was the brain behind it. And he was brilliant. That was a brilliant idea. So if you're viewing this, you can see this picture here. There's Marilyn Monroe, a huge crowd of people and press. Yeah, there's at least 50 or 100 people. I see some big studio lights. They shut down the whole street not the whole street, part of the street. Yeah, and if you look at the original picture, you can actually see other photographers in the background. So she seems to be surrounded at least 180 degrees by photographers. Yeah. And she's wearing high heels. And some a a woman in high heels would never just casually go stand on grading. No, that would be the last (laughs) place I would stand. Yeah, because it will slip and break off. I'm impressed that you picked up on that. I occasionally wear high heels in New York City because it's the city. You have yeah, to, right? Yeah, you have to. You have to be dressed up. Anyway, point being, it, it was it was clearly a setup. But looking at the picture, I would have guessed that they probably brought in a wind machine or something. But it was actually from a train going underneath. That's what at I read. At least that's the story I, that's told. I mean, who knows what they set up if they set something up. But based on what I read, it was just the train. And um, what about these photographers who are directly behind her, who didn't get a shot? They oh, yeah. Instead, got a picture of the photographer taking one of the most iconic shots well, the world see, has ever Sam known. See, Sam was granted special access, so he was the only one allowed on the other side. And they went and they reshot the scenes, these scenes from the movie. And then they also did a special promotional photo shoot. I think she was doing the same thing, putting her dress up. And he was the only one that had access to that shoot as well. So they had a really special uh, relationship professionally. And personally, I think the lesson here is a bit, a bit of networking, right? Like yeah. get to know people, stick with them, build relationships and yeah. friendships. And, and, and long term, you don't know who the next Marilyn Monroe is going to be. It could be your driver. <laughs> yeah. What are the odds of that? But it's possible. Yeah, I think, you know, be nice to your Uber guy. We're in a really know. competitive industry, but I think that it can be tempting to be competitive with people in your field. Yeah. But it's just so much nicer to make friends with people and to network and uh, to have fun while you're doing it. Like, I love Matt Granger. We do the same thing. There's no reason to compete. You can just network and have fun and a lot of nice things come up from that. So these two, they met up, they liked each other as people and they helped each other's careers a lot to to the point where actually she kind of overshadowed his career a little bit because uh, a little bit when you uh, <laughs> Marilyn Monroe overshadowed everybody. Yeah. Well, you don't even these are the only pictures that come up when you when you look him up pretty much. So is this the first time anybody's compared Matt Granger to Marilyn Monroe? No, it happens <laughs> it's, all the time. It's an He's probably analogy. tired of dealing with it. Oh, the Marilyn Monroe thing again. I wish I could do an Australian accent. (laughs) I try. It just offends him. Dorothea Lange, migrant mother, March 1936. I'm sure all of you know this picture. It's of a woman. She's with her two children. Her brow is wrinkled with worry. She's looking off into the distance. A beautiful black and white picture. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can look it up and, and you'll recognize it immediately. So she has what looks like two boys, her two children probably, Mm -hmm. um, huddled up close to, to close to her they seem to be uh, covering their face kind of burying it in her shoulders she's got very simple sort of farmer clothes you can see the edges of her shirt are <laughs> just tattered 
She has uh, like a blanket kind of wrapped around her legs, but it's it's very worn. It's 1936, so the picture, of course, is in black and white. Yeah. But the, the level of detail and the exposure are just perfect. The lighting is nice and soft, and so it shows uh, the, the details of the lines in her furrowed brow. She seems very concerned. It's a beautiful and she's not picture. Looking at the camera, but she's looking off into the distance. Yeah. She's almost doing that glamour shots thing where you have your hand on your chin. No, I wouldn't say that. Except this conveys completely <laughs> naturally. This was an interesting picture to me because there are two fairly different sides to this story. Lang's story is that she was she was in Depression era California. Uh, she was working for the Resettlement Administration. So she was going around and taking pictures of these workers that had been uprooted by the Dust Bowl. You know, huge drought. All of the crops die. There are all of these workers and farmers and people that don't have food or work, right? If there are no crops, there can't be farmers. So they're... Well, for people who don't know, what's the Dust Bowl? Well, everything died in this yeah, one part of the United States. Yeah. There's no vegetation. And uh, without vegetation, the winds just sort of pick up and we have this just this terrible drought. And um, nobody can grow food. And they can't easily just run to the supermarket. They don't have <laughs> the, lots of money or anything. So they're literally starving to death. They can't produce food. They can't support yeah, their families. Like I'm it's saying, a it's disaster. Displacing the farmers and, and people don't have food. So she's going around and she's taking pictures and she's documenting this for the resettlement administration. Um, she drove up to a camp of starving workers. There were a couple thousand uh, what they called pea pickers there, people that were... They, they actually showed up to pick crops because they had heard that there was work there, but if frost came in and they tried to reach out and tell the workers not to meet there because there was no longer work, all of the crops had been killed, and by, but they showed up anyway. So there were a bunch of people camped out and they had no work. Um, so Lang drives up. She sees all of these workers camping out. Um, she sees this woman and she's in a, a lean-to tent with her children. And she takes about six pictures over the course of 10 minutes and she gets on her way and she goes and she makes a note on her image, quote unquote, seven hungry, hungry children. Father is native Californian dispute in pea pickers camp because of failure of the early pea crop. These people had just sold their tires to buy food. So she submitted the picture to the San Francisco News and to the resettlement administration uh, in Washington, D.C. And they distributed it everywhere. The picture became famous immediately and the hunger of the people was reported and, and their need for food. And days later, the government sent in 20,000 pounds of food for the pea picker camp. At this point, the woman in the picture had already left. Lang said, I did not ask her her name or her history. She told me her age, that she was 32. She said, said that they had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that her children had killed. She had just sold the tires from her car to buy food. So that was her quote that she wrote down about the picture. 40 years later, the picture is so popular that they actually managed to find the woman. Her name is Florence Thomas. It's the 1970s, and a reporter, based on a tip, goes out and finds her living so she in... she must be in her 80s at this point. She's no longer with us. Oh, okay. She died from cancer. Oh, I see. She would have been in her 80s. I'm <clears> sorry. <throat> so this reporter tracks her down based on... An, an anonymous tip or just some kind of small tip that she gets. She recognizes her. The woman's the woman Florence is living in a trailer and she interviews her about the picture. Um, her son, Florence's son, Troy Owens in the picture says, there's no way we sold our tires because we didn't have any to sell. The only ones we had there were the, were on the Hudson, their car, and we drove off in them. I don't believe Dorothea Lang was lying. I just think she had one story mixed up with another, or she was borrowing to fill in what she didn't have. And Florence claims that Lang said that the photos would never be published. She said, I wish that she had never taken my picture. I can't get a penny out of it. She didn't ask my name. She said she wouldn't sell my pictures. She, she said that she'd send me a copy. She never did. Wow. <laughs> um, so their side of the story is that they were driving through, they had car troubles, her husband went to get the car fixed and she set up a lean-to with her family to wait for him. Lane comes along, asks if she can take pictures, says she won't sell them or distribute them. So the woman says, fine. She takes the pictures and it just becomes one of the most famous pictures of all time. And this woman never makes a penny from it. In fact, her family was embarrassed that they lived in that poverty. They were humiliated. And they saw the picture as a curse on their family name until the woman in the picture, Florence, became very ill and she needed money for medical bills. 
people knew that she was the woman from this iconic picture and they sent in a bunch of donations. And the son said that at that point they they were at peace with the picture because even though it had in the past embarrassed them, it was now bringing them a lot of support from people when they needed it. Wow. that That's hard for me to understand initially because you said that the publishing of the picture brought in 20,000 pounds of food to all these hungry people. So it seems like the payoff for the picture was immediate, even though they had vacated. It, it sort of motivated people to, to donate and actually improve people's lives. But, we don't know that she knew that at the time of the interview. Yeah. So that's something to take into consideration. But she ended up on stamps. This picture ended up on stamps. I mean, if you think of it from her point of view, this wasn't her entire existence. This was a hardship in her life. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I think we could, any of us could have, been a model in a moving picture if you took a picture at the hardest times in our lives when yeah. you're having the deepest emotions but you wouldn't want that picture published on a stamp over and over again where everybody would be like oh you're the really sad person from- yeah oh <laughs> you're the most depressing person ever yeah they put you on a stamp and they made a lot of money off of it and she didn't oh they did actually make some money off of it well um lang did not directly because the picture at the time belonged to uh was she working for the redis the redistribution association or whatever the resettlement administration okay. um so she didn't get money directly from the picture but she got a lot of recognition and some fame the picture itself sold for over a hundred thousand dollars and and then there were the wow. stamps so you know the government made money from those and so people were making money off of this woman's image she was not other than at the end when people paid for her medical bills Interesting. I wonder how they managed to do that. They they must not have just cared about model releases because nowadays you'd have to have a model release for just about uh, anything. Is it different if it's editorial? It is, but it can only be used in an editorial way. So you could take a picture of someone in public and publish it in a newspaper, but you wouldn't be able to say put it on a stamp or I sell mean, it for stock. Clearly, there are some, there were other laws or there are laws that we're not aware of. But yeah, I just found it really interesting. You see this picture of this woman, and it's so moving, and you just never think of the children growing up and the woman growing up and moving on. You never think of how her story evolved. Yeah, when you see the picture, she is a symbol of the Dust Bowl and that sort of uh, American hardship. But you don't think of her as an individual. No. Or how the how picture actually feel affected you, their story. How would you feel if you took a picture like that and it so much good came of it, but you knew that you had personally kind of made that person's life even more difficult? Do you go by the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few? Can you just move on from that? Can you say overall this I mean, picture did good? Philosophically, you can say the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, but then when it's just you and another person and they're mad at you, and that would be really hard for me to deal with. Yeah, and it, it would be difficult, and there's no undoing it. No. <laughs> you can never untake the picture. It never goes away, and she didn't even own the rights to it, so it's not like... She could have just been like, okay, you can have the picture and have all the money from it. That wouldn't have been an option for her. It was some nameless organization who sold it off to some other nameless organization. They seemed upset that she didn't have the story right either, which at first I didn't understand, but now I do. I mean, if you're going to document someone's suffering, well, Lang got a lot of flack for that as well. People criticized her for not getting their story right. But you, you're you taking a picture of a vulnerable moment, like maybe get it right, you know? Yeah, though she took a lot of pictures that day, I'm sure, yeah. and and that day was one of many days across weeks and months, and she just she just screwed it up because yeah. if you knew that picture was going to become one of the most exactly. famous pictures ever, you'd be like, I'm going to nail this. I'm going to well, take some really detailed notes. I'm not so she much judging know. her personally, but I think yeah. that there's a lesson in that where you have to have a certain amount of respect for your subject, and you have to assume you have to think about what they would think of the pictures you're taking. And maybe you're fine with the consequences and, and that doesn't matter to you, but that's something that I would now think about knowing the story. Yeah, that, that's that's a great lesson. And and even in commercial photography, we see that a lot where yeah. people, pictures of us have been used on Viagra ads. Yeah. And people always assume we'd be upset and many people would be upset. Yeah. Um, we're not because we have a good sense of humor, but other people would be quite upset about it. And in fact, many stock models sign an agreement to let their pictures be used as stock and then they end up on the picture of some CD magazine or something and they're really upset. So you, these models, most people see them as just, they're, they're actual people. Yeah. It turns out models. Yeah. Even when you see them as just a symbol of something, they have stories and they have families. 
that's a good lesson. So I thought these pictures all had a good story and a good lesson to tell. I think it's also important to, to think of every picture that, that any picture you take might become important. And how do you treat the picture differently if that's the picture that blows up? Yeah. Because for each of these photographers, we did not cover two of their photos. No, we covered one picture per, per photographer. And those mm -hmm. are the only photos from these photographers that you probably know. We all have that one photo if we're lucky. Most photographers never get that one photo. Yeah. And maybe you should treat every picture like the most important one. That's a good, that's a good lesson, Tony. And on that note... I'm going to remind you that this episode is brought to you by Squarespace. It's the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. So go to squarespace.com slash Tony and use the coupon code PORTFOLIO to get 10% off of your entire purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Thanks, Squarespace, for supporting us. It's just a great way to set up a portfolio. We both use it for our portfolios. Yeah. Northropphotography.com and ChelseaNorthrop.com if you just want to get an idea of how they look and the types of pictures that we take. You can um, see more of this podcast at stp.io slash podcast if you're watching on YouTube. It's great to get the audio version because you can listen to it while you drive and you don't have to be sitting at a computer. Mm -hmm. If you're listening online. Yeah, or... please share it. Please share it and send it to your friends that love photography. We think everybody has something they'll learn about photography. Ratings and iTunes really help us out. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks.